Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad you've decided to join us. This is a series, as it has been in the past, of the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we're doing a series entitled Witnessing and Evangelism. This is a series that was prepared for the second quarter, that is April through June of 2012. This is lesson number 12 in that series entitled, entitled Evaluating, Witnessing, and Evangelism. And before we begin, we'd like to ask you to bow our, your heads with us as we pray. Our loving Father, as we think about the task yet before us, before the work can be finished, before the world can be warned, there certainly is a reason for thinking about evangelism and witnessing. Be with us now as we discuss this important topic that we may represent you correctly and inspire others to uh, think about it more deeply as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is there a role for evaluation in our evangelistic and witnessing efforts? If we try to be too detailed in our evaluation, are we attempting to apply business techniques to evangelism? Is there any way to evaluate the work of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever thought about how to evaluate the Holy Spirit? Well, what about evaluating other church activities? Do you ever evaluate the pastor's sermon on Sabbath morning. What about your Sabbath school class or your Sabbath school teacher? Now, that doesn't apply to me, of course. No, <laughs> There's one huge negative feedback from evaluation that we all should constantly keep in mind. The fact that we're not in the kingdom of heaven is proof that we have not finished the work. I don't think anyone can argue with that particular fact. So what should be the goals of witnessing and evangelism? And for those of you who have been regular listeners, and maybe some of you who are just listening for the first time, um, we prepare a series of questions um, and materials for each Sabbath school class in the form of a handout. And you can, you can get that handout, if you like, by going to our website. It's, it's entitled theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X. Dot org and click on the Sabbath School link and you'll find us there. So, is, our, is it our goal to win as many people as possible to the church and get them baptized so, so that a short time later they can leave again? Maybe the first part, but not the second. Not the second part. Well, should we evac evaluate how effective someone's witnessing or evangelism is by seeing how many people are brought into the church by the people that person brought in? I heard a pastor one time that says, we shouldn't evaluate people based on how many, how, how many people they bring in. We should evaluate them on how many people are brought in by the people they brought in. Wouldn't that be a better test of someone's genuine uh, effectiveness or Christianity? You're saying instead of counting the number of children, count the number of grandchildren? Something like that, yes. How about great-grandchildren? I think yeah, that would that be too. better. <laughs> maybe, maybe a few more <laughs> generations off. That would even be better. Well, here's the question I'd like us to think about particularly today. What is the most urgent work for the church to be addressing itself to at this point in history? Is it bringing more and more members into the church? That's certainly a laudable goal, but is it, is it the most important one? Or should the church's goal be to prepare a people who are so settled into the truth, and now I'm using the, the words of Ellen White, both intellectually and spiritually so they cannot be moved, and thus, prepared to stand among the 144,000? Wouldn't that be a more important goal so that we, this whole sinful sin mess can be brought to an end? Can you re restate that? I, I'm not quite sure how to follow that. Okay, I was happy to <clears throat> restate that. The church is anxious to bring in more members. We're recent, a recent a poll was done, not a poll, actually a study was done suggesting, and I, I need to find out where this is, who exactly did this, but it's suggesting that the Adventist Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is still, or, or was again, the fastest growing church in North America. Now, is that saying much? 
Well, <laughs> probably not. Probably not. But I thought, um, the, I thought the Mormons had that. Uh, for a while, there, and the Pentecostals had it for a while and so forth, but the Adventists are apparently at the top right now. The challenge is this, uh, to be honest, those numbers that are being added to the Seventh-day Adventist Church are largely immigrants and American blacks. They are not Caucasians, by and large. But my question that you asked about was this. Um, should we be focusing on just getting more and more members into the church? I mean, suppose, suppose we could win every, everybody in the whole world to become the Seventh-day Adventist. Would the work be done? Wasn't it prophesied that those who would come into the Adventist church in the end would have more fervor, belief, and be stronger than actually the Adventists who had been in it sometimes for their life? I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure that that has been prophesied, but what, what we do know is that there's going to be the latter rain and there's going to be the shaking. So there's going to be a sifting and a sorting and a whatever. Which comes first? I mean, the latter, roar, latter, latter rain, rain or the shaking? Well, they're going to both happen at the same time, but the, the sh shaking is probably going to be first. Yeah. Yeah. What about the children we lose all the time? Yeah, exactly. This yeah. This bothers me. If the truth, yes. So the number who join the Adventist Church or are members of the Adventist Church, that's easy to count. Mm -hmm. How do you count how many are ready to be part of the 144,000? That's the problem. You can't. Or is there anyone that's ready? Well, I don't know. That's a good question. Is it, is it joining the Adventist Church or? We can count that. Or, or is what, my perception is that it's not joining the Adventist church that's what's going to bring the end to the end. It's, it's, um, it's just uh, accepting a truth and, and uh, I don't know, to, to phrase it that way, well, as soon as everybody Oh, every, as soon as all the people that are going to be saved join the church, why then we're we're in good shape? Why then the Lord can come? I, maybe that's the way it is, but I'm a little uncomfortable with that. No, so. no, that's not that's not the issue. <clears throat> that's not the point. Scripture says very clearly, Revelation seven, Revelation fourteen, God is holding back the winds of strife until God's people have been sealed, and it gives the number of those people as 144,000. So you go around looking. How is this sealing going to happen? And if you go to Ephesians, you go to Ephesians 1, uh, verse 31, I believe it is. And, and, and No, it's 4, verse 31 and verse 13. It says that the sealing is part of the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's part of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has given us scripture. That's his main task. So I would say that these people probably are stu careful students of, of scripture. Then we go to Ellen White. And this, the easiest place to find this is probably in volume four of the Bible Commentary, page 1161, paragraph six. When those who are sealed are those who are, who are so settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. And again, many times, Ellen White suggests, and the Bible suggests, that the reason God hasn't come yet is because if he came, if he, if he unleashed Satan too soon, and let Satan have his way too soon, so many people, and there's a whole three or four pages about that in evangelism, page uh, 694 through 697. So what we need to be focusing on, what we should be focusing on, or what would be ideal if we could focus on it, would be preparing the people for to be among those faithful ones that will finish the work. Well, I fit right in with that. Of course. Because I've got, problem. I know exactly what I believe, and nobody's going to move me. There you nobody's going to change my mind about anything. <laughs> but are you set it into the truth? <laughs> That's what Peter thought, too. <laughs> but it's been said that if you worship the same picture of God this year that you worshiped a couple of years ago, you have a graven image. You, so the, uh, what can we know about the infinite? I mean, it should be un, without limit. Mm -hmm. and so we should be constantly Continue growing. Constantly under, uh, expanding our understanding of the infinite one, and yeah. 
So our, <clears throat> what our, is the truth right. that we're supposed to be so intellectually and spiritually settled into? Is yeah. it is yeah. it the doctrines of the Seventh Day Adventist Church? Is is no. is, 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 is it the gospel? Is that what we're supposed to be? Well, and, and if you if you read the writings of Paul, he would suggest that it's the gospel. It's love. It's it's, it's being the truth a about God. And the truth, and that involves the truth about the great controversy, the the truth about God in contrast to the lies and the misrepresentations from the devil, and that means God's side is the loving side, Satan's side is the selfish side. All of that's included. And you have God's side inside you. You ex you exhibit God's character during the harshest conditions. That's right. Now I had I had a geology teacher that threw us a curve. We studied the rocks and identifying the rocks. Then for the test, he changed the rocks, the colors. They were the same rocks, but we couldn't go by color. And we had to know those rocks. Mm -hmm. And I failed the test because I had the colors memorized. And I think God may do that. We have to know love so mm -hmm. intimately in our lives that when we're thrown a curve, we automatically react with love. And even though the test isn't the same as we've learned maybe in Sabbath school or church, <clears throat> but we will have to exercise love in this test. Here's, here's the point. Let, let, there are a few things we can say for sure. At the very end, there are going to be two individuals claiming to be Christ. And the ones who are going to be saved are those who are able to distinguish between those two. The devil will come first, and, and I'm sure the devil is clever enough to send a lot of fakes before he shows up. So. Who knows how many fakes will come before him? But when he shows up, he, according to Revelation 13, will apparently evangelize virtually the whole world, will join his side. But there will be a small group who know God so well and understand the truth of the gospel so well and understand the truth about God so well that they cannot be deceived. And those are the ones that God is waiting for. When he has a sufficient number of those people ready, the end will come. They say that we're supposed to know a fake dollar bill from a real dollar bill by studying the real dollar bill. That's right. So when the fake Jesus comes, we know that that's a fake Jesus and that's not the one that we're waiting for. And the important point there is this. The, more, the most dangerous counterfeit is the one that's closest to the real one. Mm -hmm. Wait, how do you know when you've got the real one that you can study it right now? I mean, by all his, this by can his happen word. right now. I mean, there's a lot of people that study his word. They're not Adventists. Well, there's a lot of people. Here's the, here's and the, they will recognize God. If you, if the, well, if the, they if the won't, but you will. So no, I no, guess I'm, we're good. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm saying the other church, the other churches will have people that will recognize this is Jesus, even when some of us don't, because they have studied and learned. I don't know. This is all seems pretty vague to me. It, 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 I'll, I'll tell you very clear. If, if the Bible is not clear to those who spend enough time studying it, then God has failed us. The Bible is not clear? Yes. What about, what about your situation? Is that going to be clear? I'm not saved based on my situation. I'm, based on, I'm, I'm saved based on my understanding of the truth about God as yeah, presented but is, in Scripture. Doesn't the truth help you understand your situation? Well, I, I mean, it, it, it eventually has to, probably has to be applied to my situation, but the truth is truth. I know, but there's got to be a, there's got to be a practical end to it somehow. Yeah. I mean, just because you have a bunch of knowledge in your head doesn't mean that, yeah, that but, you're going to do it. Yeah, and, and, you know, in, G, in Jesus' day, he ran into a great deal of uh, opposition and problems in his life by people who who were quite uh, well studied and well versed in the scripture. So there's got to be something more than just, than just. Uh, well, I, I told you, we, what we need to get from scripture is not just, okay, what do we know about David and Saul and, and <coughs> Moses and, and Noah, etc. What we need to get from scripture is the truth about God. What does each one of those books tell us about God? And if we have that picture clear, then we are, and, and, and I believe, and assuming that, assuming that we like what we see, number two, and number three, we honestly want to be like that. The other side of that coin, because mm -hmm. those coins have two sides. <laughs> uh, in last day events, 
41.1 says, Time will last a little longer until the inhabitants of the earth have filled up the cup of their iniquity, and then the wrath of God which has so long slumbered, will awake, and this land of light will drink the cup of his unmingled wrath. And I, I, I think that's probably true, but I think God has probably held that back. I think he's, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I so, so this whole thing, the reason we're waiting around here is there's just not enough of us ready? Basically, I think that's correct. That's what seems to be suggested by a number of scriptures. It's suggested by 2 Peter 3. It's suggested by Revelation 7, Revelation 14, the first five verses. It's suggested by a lot of passages in Ellen White. How, how, is, how is that going to come to be? Because, you know, people are born mm -hmm. and they become more aware and eventually, like everyone around this table, why they're all ready and waiting, but there aren't enough and then we die off, and so yeah. now we've got a whole new batch we've got to train in. This is a challenge. How, how do we get them all trained in at, you know, at the right, you know? Yeah, where do you get into this circle? I mean, <laughs> yeah. where, where, do you, where do you enter this, this cycle? Because that's, you'd, you'd obviously we, we, like to go there. And we need to be very clear, and, and this is a lesson about evaluation. We need to get back to that. But <laughs> <laughs> we need to be very clear, there has never been a generation who have had the truth more available and in, in, in present, presenting in, in more forms and appealing to us in more different ways, more readily accessible even by computers now than our generation. But we have enough? no excuse. <laughs> is it enough? Still. Well, no, uh, there's going to be a lot of people who are still rebels. Maybe, maybe 10 years or 20 years from now, you're going to say it again, and it's going to even be more than it is today. I hope so. <laughs> I hope it's true. Doesn't that get back, we are judged according to what chances we had? What you're saying yes. is we've got the maximum. No, we I'm are going to be, well, it, I'm as saying far as we've gone. More than anybody ahead of us. Exactly, but mm -hmm. we are going to be judged at a different level to the cannibal in the highlands in New Guinea. That's right. Got to be. Yes. And that goes across the whole world, so yes. which means we've got different levels of salvation we're yes. going to be judged on. But here's the, here's the thing, and that's absolutely correct. However, there will be a small group, and the Bible identifies them as 144,000, right. who will stand up and correctly represent God to the final events of this earth's history. And other people who are safe to save may die off in various ways, whole islands are going to be buried in the sea, it says, etc. I don't know how all that's going to work out. But I do know this. God will have to have at the end that core group that stand up and say, I don't care what the devil says to me, if he's this much in front of my face, I will not be deceived by his misrepresentations because I know God and this is the kind of person he is and I'm not going to be misled. And those are the kind of people, if God had a core group like that, he could do as he did with the disciples. What he, was it that got the flood started? The iniquity of the people reached so high a spot that God yeah, had to step in and do something. Now, if the iniquity of the world goes up, 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 these that you're talking about are going to stand out more, more, and more. Yeah. And, and then the trials and stuff that come to them purify them. And so I think there's a, there's a, a uh, separating some kind of synergy mm -hmm. between what's going on in the wickedness of the world and those who are studying to know Jesus. And, and that division is going to be more and more and mm -hmm. it, it'll bring on the end times. I, I, I'm sure that's true. But we need to remember that in, in Noah's day, basically God brought on the flood because there was only one family and probably primarily one person that was still listening to him. Yeah, so he's got 144,000. I mean, that's not many more in this world. Yeah. Well, um, you, you know, t trial and testing, uh, assuming you, you, you respond to that trial and that yeah. testing, well, it strengthens you. Are, are these 144,000 in the end, are they, um, are they what they need to be in part because 
of those tests Absolutely. that they face. You they're, don't, you don't, they're not necessarily, they're not necessarily um, uh, what we would say is the 144,000 before those tests come. Well, here's the point. Here, the, here's testing, the testing uh, may actually help to formulate those let, people. Let me, let me prove that point to you. If you were the devil and you saw the 144,000 coming together, what would you do? Throw a firecracker in the middle of them. You would do everything, because if those people have come together, you're finished. You would do everything possible to stop it. But it's the very he, things that he does that brings it on even more. Exactly. Well, that, and that was the story with the, at the end of Christ's life. Yeah. Same story, exactly. That's right. I, I guess my position is that... Um, there's a chance I might ultimately end up as one of the 144,000, yeah. but I'm not there now. Well, that, but that's not but, that, no. but as that time comes, and as I respond to those times, then I am ref I'm, I'm refined even, even more. I, that's all that's true. My, my point is, if there were enough people approaching that level of readiness, God would say, okay, we've waited long enough. He's waiting for us. We are not waiting for him. Are, are the 144,000 at that time when they are identified as 144,000, let's say, are they any better than the people who died 100 years ago and who are not members of the 144,000? Uh, are, are you have to be qualified to be a member of the 144,000 in, in order to, we're talking about evaluation here now, yeah. evangelism. Yes. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you, I mean, are there, are there, are there, are there people who are, are anybody well, walks yeah. into those pearly gates is, is, uh, um, could, could be a member of the 144,000 except that they just weren't gathered together at a particular time or are, are they some, are they there are some who clearly have lived in the past who could have been a part of that 144,000 right there are many who have been Christians the, the highlands in, of New Guinea where I spent three months earlier in my career etc there may be some saints up there but they have not had the kind of exposure they've not had the opportunity of education that we've had so God is going to judge them based on what they had a chance to know that, and, and they may die. And God may say, okay, you're fine to take into the kingdom of heaven, but you would never make the 144,000 because the devil could play with you too easy. And, and I, I think that's, I think we need to be honest with, with that kind of well, information. Well, you know, but I, I don't think that that is primarily a developing time. I think that those, that time demonstrates what those people uh, are you know, what who, like Jesus couldn't demonstrate how f how much he loved until what happened to him happened to him, and these people are going to do going to go through essentially the same kind of thing. I believe mm -hmm. they just don't have to die, but that same kind of mental anguish, that same type of dedication, that same type of Lord, it's not me, it has to be you, and he threw his life into his father's hands. I think that's what this 144,000 are going to have to do. If, I, if I'm living now, going along with the evaluation thing, if I'm living now, and I, I die a natural death in old age before this 144,000 comes to materialize, evaluating evangelism here, have I failed? Shouldn't I be... I mean, if if it's possible right now, all we got to do is get this group of people together. Um, well, every generation that's preceded us has failed, because Jesus has not come back yet. Well, you know, God has an army or a navy, and He has good soldiers in it, but the 144,000 in it, it's not necessarily 144,000, are going to be His seals, yeah, the who seals. have been tested and well, learned. Let's get those... And then People when they will be given assignments during these last times where what they have learned, tested, and been evaluated on will come through. Yeah. And so it's not to say that the army of God isn't good, but um, 
these are the seals. Oh, but but if I don't even know if I can be a seal, I'll be happy to be an, uh, a, a you know a rank and file soldier or whatever. If all it takes is we just got to get them together, let's get on the ball and let's get them together. How can well, we do that? Well, I, I think I think Norm's right on this. That I, I mean, I go more with him. Is that something's got to happen to make these blossom out? And, well, um, you, and you I don't think there's nothing we can anything we can do before that except you know do all we can to get the message out and, and whether, that's, that's, whatever we can do yeah. to do that is that's one the of the, we can do. the verses we were supposed to study for this lesson Matthew 28 a very familiar passage let me read it to you again before we go on, can we make it explicit that it's not a literal 144,000 yeah. this is a symbolic number the 144,000 is a symbolic number you can read about it in Revelation 7 a symbolic number of those people who are prepared from all different walks of life to become a part of the final, those who will be translated with ever having, without ever having tasted death. And then um, what gives you the idea that it is symbolic? Is it just well, the fact that because there's if it's, if it's not real, enough if people? Because if it's real, then it's only Jews that are eligible. And You're not eligible. I'm, none tribe. of us are eligible. Mm, and I some of the Jewish... Paul would would differ on that. No, it, it, John just says in so many words, 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 yeah. from this tribe, 12,000 from this tribe. We don't even know where those tribes are anymore. So how can it, how can it be real? So now we've got to get even that, more that, than 100. That would be the explanation for it not being real you, you as far as the number just, goes? That's just one question. very basic, yeah. one very basic reason why it has to be symbolic. Okay. So how can we evaluate okay. if we're... Let, to, let's, let's look, it says, our assignment is this, go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Now we can do that a lot easier than we used to be able to. We're, we're going all over the world with this broadcast. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Now that's part of our assignment. How do we do that? Well, in every, in every church, let's just come back a little bit closer to what the lesson was intended to be about. <laughs> and every church, there are those who are willing to help whenever they can. They end up being the faithful volunteers in almost every church program. In some cases, they may not be supremely, or supremely well qualified to do what they're doing, but they are willing. When it comes time to evaluate how a certain program is doing, let us not fall into the pit of being critical of those who are willing to serve. This does not rule out constructive criticism. And it certainly does not rule out general, I'm sorry, genuine affirmation. You may, have a, you may belong to a small church, and there may be just a few people that are always ready to volunteer because they, they feel committed to the church program. And you may feel like you could sit in the back and you knew that you could do that job a lot better than they, do, they did, or they are doing, but you didn't volunteer. So look at some examples. Some um, You're the loser mm -hmm. in that deal. Desire of Ages 825 says, where there is no active labor for others, mm -hmm. love wanes and faith grows dim. Yeah, yeah. Well, Paul traveled on to Derby and Lystra. I'm looking at Acts 16, 1 and 2, where a Christian named Timothy lived. His mother, who was also a Christian, was Jewish, but his father was a Greek. All the believers in Lystra and Iconium spoke well of Timothy. So here's an example of what? A young man who was a Christian, and what did everybody say about him? He's a good man. He's a good man. Does, does that involve evaluation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. And Paul says in Romans 16, verse 1, I recommend you our sister Phoebe, who serves the church at Sancria. Does that involve evaluation? Yeah, it does. The evaluation of a woman, we might and say. The woman, believe it or not. Because so he recommended her. So what's what's the great thing about this evaluation? I mean, well, isn't that what the Pharisees like to do? They like to go out and be evaluated as uh, people of God. And um, what's the difference between that and what we're talking about now? Well, the difference is what you're evaluating for. Well, I'm sure that they were evaluating to be people of God to be a higher up in the God, 
in the, the, what they thought was was God's plan, which it wasn't. But it's still evaluation that oh, yeah, they're well, looking for. Evaluation happens all the time. You walk down the street and you evaluate the way someone's dressed. You evaluate what say, the state their health is in as they're puffing away on their cigarette. Evaluation goes on even subconsciously all the time. So we're not talking about do we evaluate or do we not evaluate? We all evaluate. We do it all the time. But the question in is... This, in, the, in this instance, what is it good for? The purpose of uh, talking about it now is to enhance the effectiveness of our evangelism programs. We need to look at the programs. We need to see where we did well. We need to see where we didn't do so well. And we need to figure out how we can do it better next time. That's the point. Just as simple as that. Uh, it, it seems it a little back? difficult for me. It I'm, I'm not saying it's easy. Doesn't it come back to Corinthians? The Pharisees were focused on themselves. Mm -hmm. Phoebe and Timothy, I think you'll find that evaluation means they were more directed at others around them. Yes, Probably exactly. have been all their lives. The difference is the one who was focused on himself, the, the, first, the first person to be focused on himself was the devil. Yeah. If you focus on yourself, you're following his example. Now, how the, the, do you do that, though, without judging people? Well, I mean, that's the question. We, we don't want to be judgmental. We, we have to judge. We do judge, but we don't, be, we don't want to be judgmental, and that's, that's a, a balancing act. But the, the, the judging uh, for what? I mean, we cannot judge whether a person is saved or lost. No. But when you see an apple on a tree, you've got a pretty good idea that that's an apple tree. Yeah. And we have been shown that, that people will bear fruit and uh, there are some evaluations, judgments that can be made on the basis of that fruit, but not whether that person is saved or not. Mm -hmm. And we, well, we are not capable of judging people's motives. <coughs> well, we just don't have the capacity right. to do that. And that's right. To go a little further with Norm's uh, logic here, you know, if you looked at that apple tree and it, the apples were supposed to be red and they looked a little yellow, you might give it some fertilizer or something. Mm -hmm. You're not saying that it is a bad apple tree. <clears throat> you're just saying it needs a little help. Yeah. So you're going to help it. This seems to be an odd topic for a... What, what has prompted this Sabbath school <laughs> well, lesson preparer to come up with... We're, we're trying to figure out the bottom line is the church hasn't done its job effectively enough in, in terms of evangelism. And we're, we're looking at that. We're not saying that we, we have all the answers, but we're saying maybe it's time for us to look at it. So, so we're going in to try to troubleshoot this? Oh, uh, partly. And uh, you can't troubleshoot this unless you evaluate what's happening. You can't evaluate unless you have some something to draw from that this is right or wrong. So Ken, so, you, you mentioned, for example, at the beginning as introductory remarks, that the growth of the church appears to be largely um, um, immigration, new, new, new folk into this country and um, among our, our black brethren, our African-American friends. But, among the Adventist church. That's right. But the Caucasian seems to be, does not seem to show a lot of strong growth. So, so it would be appropriate to reevaluate mm -hmm. how we are evangelizing in that arena. Yes. The, okay. the, 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 if we are evangelizing now and we're spending lots of money and all kinds of things and we're not getting the kinds of results that we think that we ought to, mm -hmm then maybe we ought to look at how we're spending our money or, or, mm -hmm. or, or those kinds of things. Is that, is that kind of... Exactly. Well, and, and there, are lots of, there are lots of passages in Scripture that talk about how we... One of the things we need to do is to love people. That brings them into the church. That's right. We, we, we've been told that the first commandment is to love God, you know, with all our heart and soul and mind. And the second commandment is to love our neighbors as love ourselves. But I, I read... So, so maybe it may not be, the problem may not be necessarily... The problem may be that we're, we're, we're putting enough money and everything in and enough literature and all of that, but somehow we're, we're, it's the mechanics of the thing we're involved with, not the, not the person. 
Well, you know, Jesus went around <coughs> and he could not get a lot of the Jews and in his hometown to even, they were hard-hearted, wouldn't even look at him. He went to the Samaritans that were despised, the outcast, and a lot of them loved him. So we could be dealing in our country with varying degrees of hard-hearted people in, mm -hmm. that have certain characteristics. So it's not always that we haven't spent enough money in a certain venue, but maybe some people have reachable hearts where other people don't have reachable hearts. Well, here, here, here's one of the issues we need to think about. <coughs> we have re and and I, I didn't, don't have time to read all these texts. Deuteronomy 6, 5, Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13, Matthew 22, 37, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and 6, Revelation 14, 6, and 7. You go through those things, you find out that God commands us to love. He wants us to be more loving and so forth, to bring people into the church. But then I read in Desire of Ages, page 22, the exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, we mentioned that already, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love Him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. And I think that there is one of the main things that's going to distinguish the 144,000 from all those other people around. Do you think we should be loving to bring people into the kingdom of God yeah. and not just to say we want you in our church? Absolutely. So okay, what's so that word is what's important, love. So what do we do to get this love going? Do we invent love pills and distribute it all over to the church? So church? if I'm not loving, you know, how do I know that? Or what do I need to do to be more loving? Well, I don't an example wrong with me. An example would be you take my look love at pills. I've got those. <laughs> my my an example would be to look at your church. <laughs> Are people flocking into your church because they they're being loved? No, I'm I'm really serious here. Where does I, this I'm come serious from? too. Where does this come? We keep talking about it. Joanne keeps talking about it. Everybody keeps talking. We need more love. We need more it love. But comes, it doesn't come. It comes it in just only one come. way, and that is when they spend time with Jesus in his word and come to know him. Follow his example. And follow his example. Any other thing is just, it's just programs. So do you have a program for that? Uh, yeah, you, get, a, get, the get up in the, get up in the morning Jesus and spend a little and more time with God. There, there's three That'll things. That'll do it? The three things that God has told us that have to be required. Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. And we're talking about witnessing right here. That'll do it. And that's, those are the things you that God... You guarantee it. You guarantee that that I, will bring I can, love. I can guarantee that it won't happen without that. Yeah, that's the way to put it. But that wasn't my question. Well, Come on, I, you're I going around you. the other way. <laughs> are you going to say that if you have those three things, that love will if, flourish? If you, if you do those property, properly, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, yes, the answer is yes. Properly. Do you have a book to give it to me? Right so in your I hand, right the there. Book? You've got it right in your hand there. Okay. If you properly. Had, if you had that. We've had that. We've had this for, if how you, long have we been doing this? For for yeah. 10 years? Then you haven't been doing it properly, apparently, well, nor you know, the, any of us. Well, okay. I want to know where, how did mm -hmm. you do it yeah. properly. Come on. The Pharisees and scribes did all those things. But they did not care for other people as their family. So something was missing in the way they did those three things. So where does love come let from? Me, let, me, let me read you an example from Scripture. I hope we think we're comfortable with Jesus' example. Matthew 23, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees are the authorized interpreters of Moses' law, so you must obey and follow everything they tell you to do. Do not, however, imitate their actions because they don't practice what they preach. And, you know, it goes on, you know, how terrible few teachers of the law and Pharisees, because you do this and this, and it goes again and again, how terrible few teachers of the law and Pharisees. There's an example of a negative evaluation. And what about this one, John 8? You remember that it starts out with that the story with the woman caught in adultery, and then Jesus starts a discussion with the Pharisees, and it goes down, and look at... 
Look at starting with verse 21. Again, Jesus said to them, I will go away. You will look for me, but you will die in your sins. You cannot go where I'm going. So the Jewish authority said, he says that we cannot go where he's going. Does it, this mean that he will kill himself? And it goes down. I don't, I don't have time to read the whole thing. But Jesus says, you know, I am who I am. That is a claim right in front of the Sanhedrin that he is God. And he goes down a few verses later, and he says it again, I am who I am. And finally, we get down to verse, uh, look, starting from verse 41, uh, actually verse 39. They answered him, our father is Abraham. If you really were Abraham's children, Jesus replied, you would do the same things that he did. All I have ever done is to tell you the truth I heard from God. See, that's what we're talking about, the truth from God. Yet you are trying to kill me. Abraham did nothing like this. You are doing what your father did. God himself is the only father we have, they answered, and we are his two children. Jesus said to them, if God really were your father, you would love me. There's the love again. Because I came from God and now I am here. I did not come on my own authority, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to listen to my message. You are the children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's <laughs> desires. Do now, you? that's an evaluation. Not a, not a positive evaluation. It's a very negative evaluation. But you're also pointing out a situation where love was not there. Oh, sure. <laughs> That's okay. my point. That, well, my point still stands. Where could it come from then? Did um, Jesus say or God say that we cannot love, that we're humans and there's no way that we can love anyone but ourselves and that we have to ask uh, for the Holy Spirit inside us so that we can feel love for other people. It we can feel love for our children, mm -hmm. uh, some parents, some parents not, but to feel love for everybody in the world takes an act of God in filling us. And so it is impossible for us to do it and we just have to ask God to let do it for you, us. Let me read the verse from scripture that'll prove your point. Matthew 23, 15. How terrible for you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You sail the seas and cross whole countries to win one convert. And when you succeed, you make him twice as much as deserving of going to hell as you yourselves are. Is that because they turn him into a hateful person? Well, he, he, no, he, he, they turn it, not so much a hateful person in their case, but a person that was so caught up with the details of obeying all the rules, he didn't have time to think about loving anybody. So he only had time about thinking about himself and how he was being yeah. right of every minute of every day. But you mentioned that you got to pray to God for this love. Mm -hmm. Now, I was talking about my love pills, mm -hmm. um, which... But seems it's like, only seems by like a knowledge a, of him that you can get any love. That's right. Are you sure? I'm positive. Desire of Ages 302. If the eye is kept fixed on Christ, that's where you go there every day and you get your eye fixed on him. The work of the Spirit ceases not until the soul is conformed to his image. That's your guarantee. So we've got to know Jesus Absolutely. or else we cannot have love. That's right. Well, so Jesus said that's that. If you're my disciples, everyone will know it because you love one another. So you don't, you don't believe that a person could have this love without knowing Jesus? No. People can act what loving. About, what about the people that, that Paul talks about that you have no excuse because you have nature? Yeah, well, I mean, they can, those people can practice somewhat, you know, loving, doing loving yeah, things. But if they have no excuse because well, they have nature, nature should be able to bring I, it out well, too. As I said earlier, you can be saved without being one of the 144,000. But but Norm just said you can't because you won't have love unless you know. Well, Jesus. but you see, nature uh, um, the bears the image of uh, of God. You can, uh, I mean. Uh, nature, nature is was created by God, and and it uh, it testifies of God as well. Let and me, so, let me, yeah, go ahead. and so you can you can learn about God mm -hmm. from from nature itself. I, I want to jump down a little ways and <coughs> sort of bring us back to our lesson. The, the discussion is good, but we need to we need <laughs> to try to cover some of the material in the lesson. 
Revelation 14, 6 and 7. That's part of the first angel's message, or predecessor. Let me just read those verses again. Then I saw another angel fly high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of waters. Now, how do we evaluate our overall church growth in a, in a local community or maybe in a conference, a local conference? What about the general conference? And to add to that, what's coming up, how do you think um, the shaking and the latter rain are going to impact church growth? What's going to happen during the shaking and the latter rain? Musical there chairs. Be, there will be no ch church, will there? Will there be an organized church? Uh, organized, that's different. There will be a church that may not be organized. Well, we kept talking about the Adventist church. Yeah. But that looks like when the shaking happens, there won't be an Adventist church anymore. Probably not. Probably not. Well, uh, and, and my, my, my I mean, reason for saying, I, and I have nothing against the Adventist church. I, I've been an Adventist all my life. I believe in it. However, it appears to me that when the day comes that sa keeping a, the Seventh-day Sabbath carefully and correctly is forbidden by law, I don't see how the Seventh-day Adventist church, at le as we know it now at least, could exist. It would be against. It would be against the law. Is the is the shaking? Is is that? Is that really going to? Um, is that just just kind of a process that kind of clearly separates those who are faithful and those who aren't, or does that really shape those who are faithful? and those who aren't. I'm not sure I can make that distinction. Well, my, my perception is you have in the church those who are faithful and those who aren't. And the shaking is yeah. going to, is going to uh, uh, s separate that. It's not th those who are, who are going to be shaken out, so to speak, are not shaken out because of the action of the shaking, not within themselves. That's not going to affect their, it's just that it's clear that, that they've separated themselves. A am I making, I, well, it's not going to have anything well, to do with their spiritual it, condition. Okay, hold on, let me, let, me, let me add something to that. I believe that it will separate, but I believe <clears throat> others also true because if you see people that were friends of yours and you used to go to church with, sit beside them in church all the time, falling away, you're going to start asking yourself, what's going on? And that's going to lead to a time of questioning yourself. Right. And you're going to say, you know, what is it that, what is it that makes me stay? It's, it's going to change the focus to an individual basis as against hiding amongst a group. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Very much put so. It, to put it bluntly, that's mm -hmm. what it's yep. going to do. And some right. will focus elsewhere and we won't see them again, probably. Well, in, in some cases it could be it could be that um, they're staying. They're yeah, just okay. they're just saying, this is the emphasis that should be emphasized in the staying, and your emphasis is not correct. It could both be staying, but there will the, be, yeah. the focus could be different. There will be every <clears throat> accusation in, that you can imagine will be brought against the faithful people of God. I'm sure that the devil has got his list. I mean... Uh, for one, they'll start out calling them terrorists. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right, as the law stands right now. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it'll be something like the Holocaust. Are you a Jew? And do they say they're a Jew or they're not a Jew? I don't know. It's, it's, it's a tough... Uh, yeah. Well, one, one thing's for sure, when, at least when I read through Revelation, it's going to look like nobody's going to really be completely sure who is None Christian of us are going to be sure. God will be sure. Well, even Satan, because he's going to be blasting people all over the place, and you're going to think it's just because there might be some of those people there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the seventh day business in the last day is more of a profile thing than it is for, you know, being the thing that they're after. 
if if you look at the profile. What do you mean by profile? Well, look, bring in anybody who has any attachment to the seventh day. And these are the kind of people that I want in jail. It's not so much that they're keeping the seventh day, it's because they know the truth enough to know about the seventh day. And you could probably even say that people who are associated with those guys, even Sunday keepers, will be hauled off too because they're, they're associating with them. So it could be all kinds of things. In, in, in light of our evaluation thing, let's look at this. <laughs> if you want to look at your Sabbath school Bible study guide, look at Friday, June 22, and these points are, are brought up, and I'd like to th us to think about them for a moment. One, how do you do evaluation? Review what is involved in every aspect of the ministry you are undertaking and see how many people could take part. How can, <coughs> how can you involve other people? Where would they fit? How can you make this ministry grow? That's number one. Two, decide on the areas where significant help is needed and look for key people to fill those, these major roles. Think about some team leaders, if you will. Three, Prepare a fairly detailed written outline of all aspects of the ministry. Now, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. It sounds like you know exactly what's going to happen before it happens. And I think the devil is too smart to let us know all that. Uh, he's going to be bringing us, he, we're going to have to adapt as we go along. But this will be useful when talking to <coughs> prospective team members. They will be able to understand exactly what is required of them. And that's, that sounds reasonable. Four. Report regularly to the whole church. This will let everyone see that your ministry is a part of the local church's overall witnessing and evangelism strategy, and they will be more likely to get involved. And then five, have regular teams. Affirm team members and review progress. Ask the questions, how have we done? How are we doing? And where do we go from here? And these are the, thing, the kind of things that, that a team should be thinking of at least a few of the core people in that team should be thinking about it. They're trying to move the group forward in their evangelistic efforts. What if I don't like being part of a group? Well, you can, you can do your own thing. Um, there's no question about that. It, it, but it sounds like the, 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 the guidelines for evaluation here are, 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 a, are a group, or evaluation of a team. Yeah, and which it, do, which does coming from. Yeah. which does seem a little contradictory to some of our previous lessons because one of the things we discussed is is um, you 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 can evangelize uh, you have your own your your own you know each individual has their own yeah. temperament their own personality and that's true that we can individually <coughs> evangelize that's fine there's no problem with that. There are also opportunities, there are, there, there are places where we need to, to, to evangelize as a group, and that's what we're talking about here. You know, there's, there's a lot to be said about the personal aspect besides just the group, yeah. because I think there's a lot of things with the last days that are going to deal with the individual, not so much of a group, because you won't be able to group it together. Desire of Ages 822 would affirm that. Whatever one's calling in life, his first interest, that means whether you're a doctor, a preacher, a pilot, or whatever, whatever you're calling in life, the first interest should be to win souls for Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're saying. It's an individual thing, and I agree with you 100%. You know, my gardener is a evangelist, and um, he's of a, another church, and he will find people that he needs to talk to about God and he will hire them as his helpers and begin to bend their ear and until they um, he can maybe uh, talk to them where they want to be baptized and he has gotten several people uh, interested in the church and so he steps out in his business and hires someone to focus on and uh, really yeah good. he's yeah it's like the blind man that you were yeah. talking about yeah does this leave any room for my hobby of stamp collecting? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, if that's an opportunity. But it has to be second or third. <laughs> yeah, we've got to try all aspects. And when you look at what's happened in China, and for a 
decades we didn't know if we had any Christians. Look now, it's starting to starting to surface. So it, the word gets around, and you know they had to do a lot of that individually. Yeah, must have. We need to we need to notice something interesting. In the Old Testament, who was it that was qualified to be a priest or a pastor? The Levites. Only Levites, members of a specific tribe, were allowed to be spiritual leaders of the children of Israel. But in the New Testament, who's allowed? Anyone. Anyone who was faithful and honest and of good report could become a church leader. They were supposed to be a proven character and maturity and have sterling characteristics. How do you think the church would do if the criteria for becoming a church leader were as demanding as are the criteria for becoming a top business executive? You should be better to be a church leader than a business executive. <laughs> that would be nice. It should be obvious that if we set our standards too high, no one would qualify to be a church leader. What kind of people did Jesus encourage you to join his group? I mean, look, at Jesus was followed around by prostitutes, by fishermen with no education, by tax collectors, by what some people would consider the riffraff of society. And he, he, used, he used one man with education, right? <laughs> one of his men had education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, where do we go for prospective church leaders? even church members. This is what Ellen White says we should be looking for. And remember that Jesus brought in even people having committed adultery. Jesus looked for a moment upon the scene. Now this is the story of John 8, uh, 1 to 11. The trembling victim in her shame, the hard-faced dignitary is devoid of even human pity. His spirit of stainless purity shrank from the spectacle. Well he knew for what purpose this case had been brought to him. He read the heart and knew the character and life history of everyone in his presence. These would-be guardians of justice had themselves led their victim into sin, that they might lay a snare for Jesus. Giving no sign that he had heard their question, he stooped and fix, fixing his eyes upon the ground, began to write in the dust. That's Desire of Ages 461, paragraph 1. Then it says, this was to her, that woman, the beginning of a new life, a life of purity and peace, devoted to the service of God. In the uplifting of this fallen soul, Jesus performed a greater miracle than in healing the most grievous physical uh, disease. He cured the spiritual malady which is unto death everlasting. This penitent woman became one of his most, de most steadfast followers. With self-sacrificing love and devotion, she, for he she repaid his forgiving mercy. Once again, we want to thank you for joining us, and if you would like to look at the handouts or learn more about how we've developed this group, go to our website, theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you can find our materials there, find out the things we've studied in the past, and find stuff several weeks in advance of your own Sabbath school class, and it might, if you want to print out the handouts, you might enjoy using them in your class. Thank you for joining us.